is people relate to other people. The way business historically has always been done is based on a handshake, based on trust, and based on likability. And that's really... Welcome to the Raw Real Podcast. Are you dreaming of changing your life through opening a business? Or are you curious what obstacles entrepreneurs had to overcome on their journey? Then you're in the right place. My name is Agnes Billig, and I'm your host. Are you currently looking for a more fulfilling job? Do you want to start your own business, blog, YouTube channel, or just get your portfolio out there? It all starts with creating your own website and choosing the right hosting provider. Hosting is kind of like the home for your website and the whole infrastructure behind it. And with Bluehost, you get a free domain for the first year. You can install WordPress with just one click, which means that it's super easy. You don't need to write any code. You can create anything you want with customizable templates. So get started now and click on the link in the description below. So just again, click on the link in the description below and get started now. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Ryan Real. Today's guest on the show is Carlos Gill. He's the best-selling author of the book, The End of Marketing, Humanizing Your Brand in the Age of Social Media and AI, an international keynote speaker, a digital storyteller with over a decade of experience leading social media strategy for global brands like LinkedIn. And he's the founder and CEO of Gill Media, an international marketing company based in LA. If you want to find out how to crush it on social media this year and build a successful brand, then this interview is for you. So I thought maybe first you can give us a little bit an overview of uh, the way how you grew up and how you ended up in social media and especially starting your own company in this field. Yeah, I think that's that's a great question. And so many times when we look at others on social media and we look at all their accolades, we we fail to, or I, I don't even know if fail is the right word, but I think we overlook the journey. And the journey is really what's important. So my journey into becoming an author and speaker and social media marketer actually started in 2008 when I lost my job in the banking industry. So I started my career in the early 2000s. And uh, right around 2008, there was a downturn in the economy here in the United States and uh, really around the world. Uh, very similar to what we're experiencing now uh, in 2020. And uh, the same day I lost my job in the banking industry as a result of a layoff, I uh, turned to social media, I joined LinkedIn, and I became motivated to help others find jobs. So I started up an online job board, and it was through that online job board and through my first business as an entrepreneur where I really forced myself to learn how to use social media to build a brand, to market, to build relationships, and eventually. That startup led me down the uh, path of getting hired by brands to help them with their social media. Uh, Companies started hiring me as an employee. And one of those companies was LinkedIn right around 2015. And uh, what, what else can I say? The rest is, the rest is history. Uh, I've been you know, working in social media marketing going on 13 years. I've got a book called End of Marketing, which came out in 2019. I keep really busy uh, online uh, as, a, as a marketing thought leader. Uh, in you know, doing events as well, speaking at events all around the world, and uh, speaking with great people like you. And uh, you mentioned your book uh, about humanizing a brand. So can you tell us a little bit what that exactly means for you, also when we talk um, from a personal branding perspective? Yeah, so humanizing your brand in the context of building a brand online and specifically marketing is really focusing less about the logo and the products and services that you sell and more about what makes your company run and that's people. So I know this coming from corporate marketing that traditional marketers and executives, they pride themselves on the reputation of the brand being the history, being the products. Uh, I'll give you an example. You look at a brand like Starbucks, uh, and I kind of like to pick on them and the Nikes and the Coca-Colas of the world because those are those are big brands that are iconic. Oftentimes, people will spend more money to buy a cup of Starbucks because of the logo on the cup and because there is a status symbol, if you will, if you drink Starbucks versus you know a mom and pop coffee shop coffee. But what happens is you're buying into just the notion of the brand. But what is the brand? 
And I think what we're seeing now, especially in this COVID-19 era, um, brands need to be something more than just a logo or a status symbol. They need to stand for something. Uh, they need to spotlight the people that make up the organization. And I have this fundamental belief that your greatest asset is your employees. Without employees, you have no company. You just have products. And people in this era relate less to logos and products and services, and they relate more to other people. And what if um, you're, for example, a solopreneur and you don't have employees um, who you can post online on your social media networks? If you are a solopreneur, then you are the brand. And I say this firsthand, being early on in my marketing career, a solopreneur, where I built an entire business around my mission, built an entire business around my story. And the power of story um, is one that entrepreneurs and even big businesses shouldn't overlook. There's a reason why you started a business. You should tell people what that reason is. There's a reason why you're passionate about the business that you run. Tell people what fuels you, what that passion is all about. And even if you're a big enterprise brand, there's stories within your organization that make you human. Again, humanizing your brand isn't just a catchy you know, tagline or a cliche. It's an actual business strategy. And you know, anyone watching or listening to this right now, what I really want you to think about is people relate to other people. The way business historically has always been done is based on a handshake, based on trust, and based on likability. And that's really the industry secret to marketing today that doesn't get spoken about enough is if you build a brand that people like and they can relate to, even if you are promoting multiple people or even if you're just a solopreneur and you're kind of talking about like how, how I just shared briefly, I got into this business because I lost my job. How many other people out there have lost a job and have had to pivot because they've lost a job, whether it's in recent times or at some point in their career. You know, I don't know many professionals that are over the age of 30 that can't relate to that story because most professionals over the age of 30 at some point in time have either been fired, laid off, lost their job by no fault of their own, and they know what it's like to struggle. They know what it's like to have to pivot. So again, what makes you real and relatable to others is unique to you. And that's something that is, is, is priceless. And you know, I'm a big proponent, again, of building a brand around what makes you likable and, and what makes others relate to you versus just saying that you have the best product in town, the best service in town. Because when you really start to break it down, you know, and, and I'm going to just pick on the entrepreneurs and solopreneurs for a moment. I know a lot of people do Facebook ads for a living. I know a lot of people do SEO for a living. But what makes you different? And it's not just price or service. It's, it's you. At the end of the day, what makes you different is you. And I can sell the same services as you and price it to the penny, the same exact amount. So at that point, when you remove price and service out of the equation and you remove a logo out of the equation, what's going to make someone buy from you versus buy from me? And, and that's really why I say humanizing your brand is a strategy and it's not just a tagline or a cliche. And what do you think is the best way to share your mission online that people can really relate to you? Well, you know, there's, there's so many tools now that make it easy for you to share your story and your mission with others. You know, I'm a big fan of storytelling through Instagram stories, mm -hmm. big fan of YouTube. When I started my business back in 2008, when I got into this industry, There wasn't Instagram stories. There was no Snapchat. There was no TikTok. There was just LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. And I took to those mediums. And I'll, I'll share with you back then how I used them because you know when I say back then, we're talking about a decade ago. Things really haven't changed that much. You just have more tools now at your at your disposal. But what I would do back then was I would take to LinkedIn to identify professionals that I wanted to sell to and connect with. And then what I would do is I would go over to Twitter to see if they had a presence on Twitter. And I would do what's called social stocking. And I write about this in my book, Then the Marketing. Uh, social stocking in itself is you see who you want to do business with, but then you go see where else they have a presence. And then you connect and you engage with them on the platforms where other people aren't hitting them up. So what I mean by this is if you're a CMO and I'm trying to connect with you as a CMO, chances are you're probably getting hit up by 20 other people like me every single day on LinkedIn. So I'm never going to say anything to you on LinkedIn because I don't want you to look at me as just another sales guy. Mm -hmm. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to see, does that CMO have a presence on Instagram? Does that C CMO have a presence on Twitter? 
and I'm going to find you on those platforms. And I'm going to go engage with you on those platforms. And what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to sit back. I'm going to see what you post. I'm going to analyze what you post. I'm going to selectively swoop in and have conversation with you. And then I'm going to engage you on those mediums where I'm kind of in a league of my own. You know, that's one tactic. The other is, let's say that you have an audience that's looking at what you post. People don't want to hear a sales pitch all day. So I'll give you an example. I talk about my book, Vendor Marketing, regularly on social media. But in between like every end of marketing post, I'm going to give you like 20 other knowledge bombs mm -hmm. because those knowledge bombs establish authority. And sprinkled in between those knowledge bombs or those value bombs, I'm going to show you what I do as a person. I'm going to show you when I go get a haircut. I'm going to show you when I'm with my family. I'm going to show you what I like to eat, what I like to do for fun. I'm going to sprinkle that in because that's what makes me human and that's what makes me relatable. I can't tell you how many other men that work in marketing are like, oh, dude, like, I love that you teach me about Facebook and about social media, but you like, you always got a fresh beard lineup and a fresh haircut or, you know, women that reach out and they're like, you know, oh, like, you know, you're so relatable as a dad because I see you with your kids, you know, but at the same time, you're also a really cool marketer. You know what I mean? So like, those are just aspects that I have figured with my own brand that work really well. I've also figured out that when I make myself vulnerable and, and, and I just tell people straight up, like, you know, this whole coronavirus, you know, has me down. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sad. I've lost business. I'm, I'm trying to figure things out just like everyone else. Like those moments of vulnerability people grab onto because again, it's relatable. Not everyone can relate to closing a six figure business deal, but there's more people that can relate to the underdog stories. And, you know, I'm a big proponent of, you know, celebrate your highs and lows because there's more people that can relate to the lows. It's important that you celebrate your highs. It's important that you celebrate your wins and you tell people like, hey, I just had this meeting or I just met this person or you know, I just closed this, this client, you know, because that's what community is for, to clap you up mm -hmm. during those moments that you're on top. But community should also be there to back you up and support you when you hit your lows. And, you know, I'll tell you again, like in recent times, I'm seeing a lot of people losing their jobs. And it reminds me of when I lost my job during the last crisis in 2008. And, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people that are finding success in sharing those vulnerable moments and it's helping them, you know, from an emotional standpoint, it's helping them in some cases get back on their feet quickly. So don't underestimate the power of story. Don't underestimate the power of just being vulnerable in these times. And uh, as you mentioned, your personal activity, I checked you out a little bit on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, what you're like posting um, every day. And I saw that you're, for example, posting things like, what would your business do if Twitter and Facebook did not exist tomorrow? Or does your boss get social media? But I also saw that you don't get a ton of engagement on each post. So I'm just like wondering what your strategy behind it is. You know, so my, uh, my strategy varies. Um, it's kind of like the weather, to be, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Because what I've learned be working in this business for so long is that you need to be nimble. And what I mean by being nimble is coronavirus could happen overnight. And you could have just plan for the next year of what you're going to do. And guess what? That plan, just tear it up and throw it out the window. Expect the unexpected. And the community, you know, I'm a big proponent of community. I always say when I'm on stage or in venues like this, that community is king, not content. You know, so yeah. many old school marketers always say content is king. And I call BS on that. Without community, you have nothing. So the community, and what I mean also by community to go a little bit deeper, isn't just the people that follow you. It's the people that make up a social network. So... On Instagram, for example, I only have about 30,000 people that follow me, but I have access in theory to over a billion people on Instagram if I know how to get in front of them and get their attention. So that is the community. There is like the people that follow and show love and, and, and support me, but then like the broader community is if I want to get my content in front of hip hop fans that don't follow me, there is a hip hop fan community. There's a marketing community, et cetera, et cetera. So the community that makes up these social networks is going to ultimately dictate the success of a piece of content. 
And with that being said, if you have this strategy where you're like, oh, I'm going to post multiple times a day, this is what I'm going to post. And then all of a sudden there's a pivot that happens, like in this case, coronavirus, then what good does it do to have that strategy? Because you're not going to be posting business as usual. You're not going to be posting content, soliciting and selling people your services. What I had to do over the last few months is focus less on the good looking professional content and focus more on just giving people value, giving people knowledge. Even if it doesn't necessarily look good, I can't tell you how many times over the last few months I've posted a screenshot of a tweet as a post on Instagram. And those screenshots perform the best of any piece of content I've posted in years being on Instagram. Why is that? Because again, the community wants to be educated. And that brings me to my next point. You have a lot of personal brands, you have a lot of personalities taking the social media every single day. What's your purpose? What is what does your brand say about you? You often say that you need to focus on one of three different pillars if you want to be successful with having a personal brand. And I say this lightly because everyone has a personal brand, but you know, if you are honing in on like growing your presence, contributing more content, putting yourself out there, then like you're going to, you're trying to get to that next level. You want to be insta famous. Focus on either educating, inspiring, or entertaining. I realized many years ago that even though I like to consider myself funny, witty, I can be entertaining, I am not your comedian, I'm not your magician, I'm not your dancer, I'm an educator. That's the purpose that I serve in the whole ecosystem of social media. I teach people things, just like I'm speaking to you right now, and I'm reaching your audience, I'm educating. So... I realize if I put content on Instagram or on LinkedIn or on Twitter, just teaching people what I know that resonates with them. When I try to go outside that lane and give my audience something different, oftentimes it doesn't resonate the same way. It doesn't get the same amount of engagement. So my my advice to anyone out there going back to the strategy question is first of all, have a plan and a purpose and have an objective. And that's different than a strategy. Having an objective, a plan and purpose is not strategy. Having a plan, objective, and purpose is step one to building a strategy is why are you using any one of these mediums? The actual strategy is well, what am I going to post? When am I going to post it? Like, How am I going to get people through this funnel for them to actually buy something from me or to take some sort of action? Very, very different um, between strategy and then your objective, even though they're intertwined and mingled. The strategy, again, needs to be in these times, especially one that is so nimble that it could, ja- it could change you know, overnight or it could change immediately. And again, keep your focus around one of those three core principles, you know, educate, inspire, entertain. So would you say to always just stick to one? So in the beginning to really think about, you know, the long-term vision of your brand and then just sticking to one of these pillars consistently? Yeah, you know, uh, A-B test. I'm a big fan of A-B testing to see what works, especially when you're new. But if you've been on these mediums for a few years now, um, you have enough data that you can look back on and make an educated guess on when you post X type of content, this content performs the best. When you post this, it, it, it gets hardly any engagement. And uh, you mentioned also what to post. I think that's also a topic that a lot of people have problems with, you know. They sit down maybe the evening before and they think like, okay, what am I going to post tomorrow again um, to, you know, bring my message across, to get engagement, to get people to see me. Um, So do you have any tips um, there? What, What can help to be creative in that sense? You know, um, that's a really good question. I would say there's two things that you should really be doing on not just a daily basis, but weekly basis. I have a plan going into a week of what you kind of want to share or educate, but at the same time, leverage tools like Instagram stories, Instagram live to give people real time access into your business, into your life, into what you do. Um, and, you know, that you can't necessarily plan. Like, 
I don't necessarily know where I'm going to be on Saturday. I have a general idea, but today is Tuesday. So every day is going to be, is going to be different to, to a certain extent. Um, so again, like have a plan going into a week, what you're going to post, schedule content out, um, you know, on platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, that's what I do at least. But with Instagram, I like to keep that nimble, to, to, to be honest with you. I don't schedule anything out on Instagram. Um, it's kind of, you know, that day, that moment, what I'm feeling, what I want to share. You know, again, if you want to be successful in building a brand, you need to pay attention to what others are talking about, what others are posting about to ensure that your content aligns with, with the community, with the mm -hmm. current. And uh, like you mentioned, so community is really important in building a brand. And that's one Absolutely. thing that a lot of people struggle with because you, if you also look um, at some people, they have a really big following and then you check out the engagement on their posts and it's very low. So what do you think is the best way um, you know, also from a personal branding perspective, if we're not talking about a big team that you have for your disposal to build that community and on a long-term basis. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a growth hack for me before I had a team and it was just me doing things in a nimble manner. I'll share a few different tactics with you. One, Twitter chats. Twitter, Twitter chats are a great way for you to tap into an audience that might not necessarily follow you, but is interested in a particular niche or topic or subject matter. You know, again, I built my, my business and my career in the world of marketing and social media. There are plenty of Twitter chats around social media marketing, personal branding, millennials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so right around like 2014, 15, 16, I was doing at least a Twitter chat a day. Um, and that really helped. The other is YouTube. So, um, go to a website called Quora and on Quora, you can see what people are asking questions about. And that's something that I've used in the past since to see like, what is it that people want to know with regards to social media marketing? Ah, you know, this is something that I can speak about. And I already know what the question is because I see it in front of me on Quora. And you know, I when I when I was you know going hard on YouTube, creating how-to videos and tutorials, I would literally just go on Quora, see what people's questions were, record a video, and then boom, drop that content on YouTube, and then that content gets indexed on Google. And now when people go to Google and they type in like how to use Instagram Stories, how to use Facebook Marketplace, my video ranks high in search on Google. That's Again, kind of a growth hack when you don't have a big audience or a big following to get your face out there, get your name out there. But the key, to be frank with you, is consistency. You can't just make one YouTube video and expect to become insta-famous or become wealthy or sell all these courses. Like I've been grinding and doing this for a decade. And now I have a book. And that book is actually what's kind of giving my brand like a new level of life, a new, a new meaning, so to speak. Because a book is very different than a YouTube video or a podcast or a tweet. But what I will say is that book wouldn't have been possible without doing A, B, and C, and D, and E leading up to selling a book. And I know there are folks that do it in reverse. There's, there's folks that self-publish. They write a book first. And then they focus on building the thought leadership on Medium and YouTube and doing a podcast and doing Twitter. And, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever route you decide to take, the key is to be consistent and be very realistic with your expectations, because I don't know a single person, not one, that writes one blog post or makes one YouTube video, records one podcast episode, and then they're set. doesn't work like that. You have to do the same thing over and over for a lot of times in order for people to start getting to know who you are. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier, feel comfortable with you. Like that's, that's the biggest piece. If someone feels comfortable with you and relates to you, they're going to tell other people about you. But that takes time. And uh, in general, when we also talk about growing your brand and you also don't have a huge budget when it comes to like ads spending, um, can you share some of the you know growth hacks that people maybe can apply to yeah, get in front of the right audience? Growth hacks to get in front of the right audience. Um, identify who it is that you're trying to sell to. Research them. See what they're talking about. See where they have a presence. And get in front of them. Form conversation. 
So you mean engage with them on comments on Facebook, Instagram? Correct. And uh, what are the common mistakes that you see um, when it comes to content creation? When it comes to content creation, I see people that are aggressively selling. They, um, you know, they're just constantly promoting their services, constantly talking about what they sell, not giving enough value. And, you know, again, no one really wants to be sold to. Like at the end of the day, I don't like to be sold to. You probably don't like to be sold to, especially when you don't know who someone is. So focus on giving more value. I often like to refer to, to social media and specifically relationships that you build on social media, very similar to like a 401k account or an investment account. Mm -hmm. Everyone that you meet has a value associated with them, but it takes time of cultivating that relationship in order for that value to mature. And it doesn't can happen right away. Can you give us a couple of examples of how someone can be not salesy, but still be a little bit salesy to get conversions, of course, for their business? How you can be salesy without being salesy? Man, such a good question. I, I would <laughs> say I would say it's all in the questions that you ask, right? So, um, you know, if I'm trying to sell social media management services, I'm going to tell you all the reasons why you need to have someone audit your social media presence, why you need to have someone that is writing copy for you. I'm like, I'm going to give you all the must-haves that you need and why. And then I'm going to ask you, you know, do you have a dedicated social media team? Do you have dedicated resources? And you say no in posts that I, that I put, and that's, that opens up the door for me to engage you directly. Mm -hmm. Which is a very different delivery than just coming out and saying like, hey, I'm a social media marketing agency. You know, click my website to learn about what we do. Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, um, I mean, you're very successful now when it comes to marketing, but I'm sure that wasn't always the case. So what were some of the uh, troubles that you experienced along your way? Ah, so many, so many experiences uh, or troubles, I should say. Um, you know, I, I would say the number one aspect where I messed up early on was probably being a little too aggressive, which is why nowadays in my older years, so to speak, I tell people like, reel it back. Like early on, I was 25 when I started my first business. And I remember joining like every single LinkedIn group, spamming the hell out of people. And no one really likes that. You know, it, 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 it burned bridges with people early on. Um, you know, perception is everything in online marketing. People perceive you to be, you know, snake oil salesman or too aggressive or too spammy. You know, word, word catches on, you know. And then the flip side to that is that the advantage to getting your name out there quickly is people like know who you are. But the key is to have the right people know who you are. Um, also, again, patience. You know, early on in my career, I wanted things to happen too fast. I wanted to, to write a book early on. I wanted people to know who I was and I really wasn't ready for it. So, you know, you hear it's, it's like a cliche a lot, like be patient, be patient. And I think, especially when you're young, you want things to happen right away. And, you know, I, I look back now, I'm 36, almost 40. And I've been doing this since I was in my mid twenties. And I realized like, I'm actually a good place because I put in the work, I let time do its magic, and you know here I am you know, over a decade later. And uh, because you mentioned you were really pushy in the beginning, you joined a lot of groups, you were mm -hmm. spamming people. So how did you convert your first clients? Like what were the strategies that worked for you in the beginning? Um, also maybe where you didn't have to wait super long yeah, to, to get someone to purchase your services. So it was different back then. It is, than it is now slightly, you know, nowadays you have different resources that you can hop on. Like I'll give you an example, Fiverr, Upwork, you know, especially if you're a solopreneur, um, even though these websites are labeled as freelancer websites, you know, a client's a client, especially if they're paying. So, um, you know, let go of your pride, let go of your ego let go of titles because a freelancer and a solopreneur, from my perspective, are the same exact thing. 
um, leverage these resources to promote yourself and your services and get paying clients. You know, I'd say that's the low hanging fruit. Even if you don't know a lot of people, the flip side to that is get involved in your community. So many entrepreneurs are constantly trying to get what I refer to as the big fish. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to go to these big cities, big markets, New York, the LA's of the world, and they're missing out on every single business that has budget in between those big cities. And what do you think is the best way to be part of a community? Would you say, for example, joining a mastermind? Um, yes and no. So oftentimes masterminds, you have to be invited or you have to pay to join a mastermind. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think you necessarily have to pay um, in order to be part of a mastermind, but join free groups. Like there's groups on Facebook, there's groups on LinkedIn, join those groups, start working the groups, start contributing to them. And again, over time, it's like anything else. You're going to see who the players are. You're going to form relationships, hopefully, with them. You're going to get on their radar. And when the time is right, you know, people take notice. And they will, they will likely reach out to you versus you having to reach out to them. Um, and when it comes to social media, what do you think um, are the big opportunities currently? Big opportunities. I recently joined TikTok. Uh, yeah, I said to myself, I wasn't going to join TikTok. I haven't been a fan of it, uh, just because I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit older than the, the target demo on there. But, you know, part of being a master marketer is having your finger on the pulse and knowing what's what, what's working, why people are gravitating to something. Um, so I'd say if you are looking to get a little bit of a, uh, of an impressions boost and you're trying to reach a younger audience, TikTok is a good place to be. Twitch is a good place to be. Uh, especially again from the gaming community, um, you know, there's other resources out there like Jiffy, like uh, Unsplash, uh, which is uh, not necessarily social networks, but these are resources to put your content and have others see you. Um, so, like, I'd say again, you know, try to see what works. If something doesn't work, fail fast, pivot, move in another direction. Um, but don't just get caught up on the traditional Facebook, Instagram. Twitter, LinkedIn, you know, A-B test and really see what works. And what do you think is the time frame of testing to see if something works? Because usually that's not like one week. I mean, you can't determine no, if it it's works. It's not one week. Yeah, it can, be a course of, it can be a course of a month. It can be a course of a few months. Um, you know, some of these social networks is going to be dependent on the content that you post. So, you know, again, I joined TikTok recently. It's taking me you know, about nine videos in to kind of see, you know, what the people that follow me or that I'm connected to like, uh, what performs best, at least, you know, for, for me, who talks about business and marketing, you know, Jiffy, I joined two weeks ago and I had a designer create like 10 different stickers for me and I'm almost had a million views on Jiffy, you know, so wow, that's, I would, uh, that's I would consider bit. that to be, to be a lot greater of a success than being on TikTok and it's, it's less effort. You, know, mm. you just create stickers, you create just and boom, like you can walk away and not do anything else. Mm. Um, you know, Unsplash, another resource. Are you familiar with Unsplash? No, I haven't heard of it. So it's a, it's a website where people go to download photos to then use those photos in social posts, use those photos on their mm. website. Yeah. So I'm pulling up my, my Unsplash account right now. And lifetime, since I started my Unsplash account a few months ago, I've got 600,000 views. And those are just photos of me, like well-taken professional photos of me that now are on other people's websites, other people are using on social media. So it's like the ultimate growth hack. Yeah. People get your face out there through totally. other, other mediums. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, all of these social media platforms, they come and go, right? I mean, every one of them has their momentum and then, you know, it goes a little bit down. So keeping this in mind, um, how can we be prepared? Um, or the, for the future and how should we act around them? Um, don't get too invested in these, in these social networks. And what I mean by that is don't build an entire business around the social networks. The social networks should be complementary to your business. And you know, I think if you're a creator, it's harder because you depend on getting reach and getting a set number of views. Totally. I'm growing your, in, you know, your, your influence and your followers. But if you're an, in, if you're an influencer, you're creative, sell merch, sell courses, 
right? You should be absolutely building up your own email list. I'm a big fan of own channels. Again, it goes back to the training that I have from working in corporate marketing. Own channels, you own them. Facebook can go away tomorrow, but you still have your email list. You still have your newsletter. You still have your website. So I'd say using both of those in parallel, using social media as a means to build your brand, get yourself out there, but at the same time, siphoning data from these social networks is is definitely the the move. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Those were some amazing tips. Um, Do you still have a last key takeaway, a personal insight that helped you grow that you would like to share? Personal insight that helped me grow, uh, go outside your comfort zone. Go to conferences. I know right now it's tough because of the uh, the corona situation but once life returns you know back to normal uh if it ever does uh go to more conferences get out get involved in your community if it's not conferences just get out in your community and meet people you know, i'd say what has really helped me grow my brand in the last two years um more so than any other point that i've been in this business is i increased my output of speaking engagements Mm -hmm. And that is what I refer to as going outside your comfort zone, getting out there, getting people to see you, getting people to meet you, then connecting online, you know, something that's been invaluable for me. But for example, in your case, you brought a book out. So I guess you're more getting the speaking gigs in instead of you actively Mm -hmm. um, pursuing them, right? Correct. So for someone who didn't bring out a book yet, um, what's a tip for them to get out of the comfort zone and uh, be seen? Um, yeah, your comfort zone, be seen. It's just starting off. You don't have a book. Again, get involved in your community. Wherever city you live in the world, get involved in the organization or organizations that host business events. Or if there's a conference in your city, get involved or if there's a conference nearby see if you can volunteer get involved however you can it's not always going to be online it's sometimes going to require that you spend your own money it's going to require that you volunteer some of your time and you're not going to get paid but it's completely worth it and how can people get in touch with you you can follow me at carlos gill 83 on twitter as well as on instagram or you can look me up on linkedin and connect with me there Thank you so much for making the time today and for everyone who's watching or listening. Anything that we talked about that resonated with you, make sure to share it on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook, and please tag us in the post. I really love looking out for what connected with you. Hey everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. I publish videos every week that are supposed to help you grow on your entrepreneurial journey. So make sure to hit that subscribe button that you don't miss any of my new videos.